Bassett suffered in history because he stood up and he thought that humanity was more important than the plain politics. He did what was right at the time that was required regardless of the circumstances and he was willing to pay the consequences for it. Bassett really uh, showed us that uh, being courageous is the right thing to do. I think he stepped into every one of those things because he truly believed he could make a difference. During a time of unrest, he was able to save so many lives. He embodied this honest integrity. He paid a cost, and, and the cost was a cost to his legacy. Bassett was definitely a leader because he was all about doing the right thing even in the face of uh, not being backed by the State Department. Bassett, who survived civil war in the United States, struggled in the midst of another civil war, this time in Haiti. Bassett would have to negotiate through this chaos and fight for his very survival. The awful fact stares me in the face that we are all under a reign of terror. Do you know who this man is? Do you know how significant he is? Ebenezer Bassett was a man of consequence. As the first African-American diplomat, Bassett had a remarkable journey. And that journey starts with a remarkable family. Genealogically, um, Ebenezer's great-grandfather, Pero, surely endured the Middle Passage, you know, the greatest forced migration in world history. Somehow he came to the Naugatuck Valley, which was then known as all of Derby. Derby was a large geographical area at that time. Now it's the smallest city in Connecticut. Slavery is not something contained to the antebellum South. Slavery is a worldwide institution at the time. It um, existed north and south. Pero and his wife Hagar had at least two children, also born into slavery in colonial Connecticut. But the New England colonies were soon bursting with revolution, and African-American slaves soon joined that rebellion and gained their freedom. I mean, a lot of towns in Connecticut had, they were like local ordinances, for lack of a better term, that when they were forced to raise troops for the Continental Army, um, they were looking at bodies, similar to the Civil War, when every town had a quota to raise. And it was expedient for some owners to allow their slaves to enlist. Ebenezer Bassett's grandfather, Tobiah, did indeed enlist, and in the process won his freedom in his newly independent country. He and his wife, Rachel, would have children that would also become leaders in Connecticut, including Eben Tobias. Again, the significance of his father and his grandfather is they were black governors. And I think a lot of people look at wh what that meant and, and people kind of celebrate what that is. But if you really understood the context, you know, the context was really about control. It, it, was, about, it was about white leadership of the times, controlling the black community and having some insight into the black community. So you allow them this structure. But to me, I think that they use the position as a way of creating opportunity. Though a leader in the community, Eben Tobias tended a family plot that likely belonged to a white Bassett family in Derby. Eben Tobias married Susan Gregory, a Pequot Native American in the early 1830s, and they have three children, including Ebenezer D. Bassett in 1833. They were definitely tenant farmers. He's listed in the 1850 census at 16 years old, along with his two siblings and his two parents, so there's three kids in the family. Um, and he's listed there at 16 years old as a tenant farmer. So we know he was farming alongside his father. Part of the integration of Derby, which kind of separated itself from other Connecticut towns and other towns throughout the United States, is everyone was afforded an education, whether black, white, whatever. Everybody was afforded an education. Because if you think about the times that he, he, um, um, that he was born in, that it would have been more profitable for his family to have Bassett be a laborer than to sit in a classroom. You know, 
That's money. He could have been out there laboring, bringing that money back. So what was that sacrifice to them? To say that education, you being able to be an educated man is more important than the well-being or the financial contributions that your labor could provide for us. In fact, his brilliance was too great to simply allow Bassett to remain in Derby. And members of the community helped Bassett attend a college prep school, the Wilbraham Monson Academy in Massachusetts. His academic success there would have placed him on track for university education, except for one factor. Ebenezer was black, and no college in the area had yet integrated. That would soon change. He probably did decide to become a teacher, and the place to do it was um, Connecticut State Normal School, which was in its infancy. And New Britain was a split community, but it had a very large population of, of its citizens that, that were abolitionists, that believed in uh, the freedom and equality. Bassett emerged at the right time for this community. You know, New Britain's you know, history to um, the Underground Railroad, all of those structures were here. And this young black man is going to be in the first graduating class, and he is going to not only be in that class, but he is going to give the address. With a degree in hand, Bassett set off to make a difference and accepted a challenging job to teach in New Haven. He taught at the Whiting School in New Haven. He taught 30 or 40 unruly kids, straightened them out and made them good students. It showed him the character, the character he had. But New Haven becomes the cradle of his adult life. He meets and marries Eliza Park. New Haven in the 1850s, again, is the crossroads for every reform movement. Everybody comes to New Haven. Um, you know, what are the issues? Civil rights, uh, it, it, education for black children, female education. Most importantly in New Haven, Bassett befriended the man that would change his life, Frederick Douglass. So the relationship really begins in what we deem as sort of this abolitionist tradition. And what's fascinating is they um, really meet um, when Douglas actually is a uh, speaker. And uh, what we find is, as Bassett is a uh, prominent local school teacher in and around uh, Connecticut, um, he had to go see uh, this great orator, Frederick Douglass. I think that really moved something in Bassett, and then that's when we really see that that cross-connection really beginning of their, their relationship, and it just blossoms from there. If you're meeting Frederick Douglass, who's always talking about a better nation for blacks and, and abolitionism and the evils of human bondage, I, it's, it's kind of hard to believe Bassett's not going to be highly influenced by this. He's not going to take up the cause. With his deep, booming voice and fierce, imposing presence, the abolitionist made a forceful and unrepentant advocate for full equality for blacks. And no doubt, Douglas pushed for something else in his young protege. It was not enough to be black and educated. He challenged Bassett to give something back to his community. Taking that challenge and building upon his love of learning, Bassett left Connecticut to become a teacher and principal at the Institute of Colored Youth in Philadelphia in 1855. It was there that Bassett really came into his own as a voice for human rights. Philadelphia, obviously, even though it is very close to the Mason-Dixon line, it is um, a city where escaped blacks go to. I know Bassett was very familiar with the Underground Railroad. I'm certain that he was influenced by um, what his, his grandparents probably endured and what he would see close up in Philadelphia. But Philadelphia was also highly influenced and continues to be, I think sometimes to this day, by Quakers. But I think if anything, Philadelphia made him more aware, more active, more committed to a lot of these civil rights causes. Under Bassett's leadership, the ICY became known for its academic excellence. Going beyond a strong classical education, Bassett pushed his students with a greater political awareness. He invited political and abolitionist leaders such as Douglas to give lectures whenever they were in town. Things radically changed with Abraham Lincoln's election and the collapse of the Union in 1860. 
Nonetheless, many Northerners were initially reluctant to be drawn into the battle. When civil war breaks out, and it is a matter of war for the Union, but more importantly, I think there are a lot of people that understand right from the beginning that it's going to be much more than just war for the Union. It is going to be a war of emancipation and freedom. The Emancipation Proclamation is going to be issued after the Battle of uh, Antietam in 1862 informally. Lincoln would issue it formally on January 1st, 1863. And once he did so, there became provisions, political provisions and legal provisions for the recruitment of black men into the Union Army. In fact, for many in the North, the war remained remote until the summer of 1863. Though the Battle of Gettysburg would end in a Union victory, the threat shook the North and support for arming militias of any able-bodied men grew. The time had come for Bassett and Black Philadelphia to engage in the fight as well. Just days after the bloody battle in Gettysburg, Bassett helped convene a massive crowd to downtown Philadelphia in an effort to recruit black soldiers. He had the honor of being the second speaker of the night, presenting the resolution, and making a rousing speech immediately before Frederick Douglass. Bassett would pretty much riff off the, you know, the sort of call the men men of color of arms in terms of sort of that battle cry, this idea of African-American men sort of uh, using the institution, such as the military, to bring down the walls of slavery and see that, you know, they're basically taking an active role of actually having African-American men participate, be they free or, you know, enslaved. Men of color, to arms, now or never, this is our golden moment. The government of the United States calls for every able-bodied colored man to enter the army for three years service and join in fighting the battles of liberty and the union. A new era is upon us. Now, therefore, is our most precious moment. Let us rush to arms. Fail now, and our race is doomed on this soil of our birth. The mood in that actual uh, meeting place or hall that night, I sort of uh, equated to when uh, individuals got word of the the Emancipation Proclamation. I think there was tremendous um, uh, joy, uh, glee, and I I think a sense of purpose. When I look down at that poster, and I look at the names of the prominent men who advocate this recruitment and, and do so much to get black men to sign up for the union cause, I, I'm always fascinated that Ebenezer D. Bassett's name is the very first. Ultimately, they will become fine combat troops for the army. By 1864, black regiments are starting to turn the tide. And there's no doubt that the 170,000 black men who ultimately fight for the Union turn the cause and make a great contribution to this war for emancipation, freedom for them and their families in many cases, and the Union. After the Civil War, the country needed rebuilding, and politically, both free blacks and former slaves were anxious to be part of that process. I mean, it was just a a transformative period, as uh, a lot of historians would deem as an unfinished revolution. There was so much promise there, and with the uh, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, uh, when African Americans uh, were basically seeing themselves for the first time as free men and free women, Douglas, Bassett, Those two gentlemen were very vocal in wanting to see African Americans, uh, the newly freed, basically find find their way and find themselves in American society. With the Union victory, Bassett turned to patrons as he looked for opportunities in the political sphere. And there was no one better than Frederick Douglass. The civil rights hero agreed that a diplomatic appointment to Haiti for his young protege would be ideal. Bassett wrote to the president directly, saying he had been persuaded by both white and black citizens to seek the Haitian posting. He referred to himself as a representative colored man who possessed an unchallenged character of probity and patriotism. My appointment 
or the appointment of some other proper person of my race would be hailed by them, especially by recently enfranchised colored citizens, as a marked recognition of our new condition in the Republic and an auspicious token of our great future. It's a very prestigious position. I think maybe Douglas would have liked something like that for himself, but Bassett certainly is um, a, a, an excellent choice in that regard. I think in essence, um, who Bassett was and the, the actual um, recommendations coming from one of the quote unquote leading African-Americans at the time uh, of Douglas, I think with Douglas, I think Douglas's words uh, carried a, uh, goes a long way in many ways, but at the same time, um, even you know the president at the time pretty much saw that Bassett was ideal for that nomination. After just a few weeks in office, Grant indeed dropped the bombshell. He would nominate a black man to serve as the chief of mission in Port-au-Prince. I nominate Ebenezer D. Bassett of Pennsylvania to be minister resident and consul general of the United States to the Republic of Haiti. Vice Gideon H. Hollister recalled. U.S. Grant, Washington, April 12, 1869. The White House moved to stop any backlash against the nomination by also appointing several former Confederate leaders to other positions in the government and promoting Bassett through favorable coverage in the media. The Senate quickly moved, 48 to 5, to confirm him. His friend Douglas was among the first to write him. Let me congratulate you and rejoice with you. Your appointment is a grand achievement for yourself and for our whole people. I have no doubt you see the importance of your position, as you shall acquit yourself in it, wisely or otherwise. We shall be affected favorably or unfavorably. By June of 1869, Bassett was ready to depart. Joined by his family, they boarded the ship to Port-au-Prince on June 5th before a great crowd who came to the port of Manhattan to meet him. Bassett waved and pledged. I shall bring no stain upon the glorious old flag of our country. Ladies and gentlemen, I may fail in this mission, but I promise you this, an honest heart, a noble endeavor, and true patriotism. The individuals and the well-wishers that wanted to see Bassett off and wishing him well off to a new foreign land, uh, in essence, they saw themselves and the progress that the nation was sort of uh, propelling itself. He departs with a lot of fanfare, and there's, you know, it's, it's really a great moment for him and his family, and they get on the boat, and, and then he gets horribly seasick. And then when they arrive in Port-au-Prince, there's a revolution in progress. And Haiti is starting to really, really feel the dire effects of revolution after revolution, coup after coup. The United States, I believe, does recognize that Trade with Haiti is a very valuable resource. His post is very important for that reason because he's there to protect the, um, the financial interests of the United States on the island. He probably becomes the most powerful American on the island, if not the most powerful man on the island. Bassett's arrival coincided with a civil war known as the Guerre de Cacaos. It had been particularly devastating, even by the standards of previous bloodletting on the island. By the autumn, Haitian President Sylvain Selnav controlled barely a tiny portion of Haiti. After the northern city of Cape Hatien fell to the rebel leader, Jean-Nicolas Nissas Jauge, Bassett had a difficult choice to make. As the situation deteriorated, Bassett felt compelled to call for help. He sent a message to Washington, pleading with Secretary of State Hamilton Fish. Gettysburg disabled. No ship here. Please send one immediately and keep it constantly here. The cry for a battleship to protect American interests was one he repeated numerous times throughout the year. But his government in Washington turned a deaf ear to his appeals. Secretary of State Fish instructed Bassett to remain as neutral as possible in hope of avoiding a backlash should the rebels gain full control. The unhappy strife going on there partakes of the nature of a civil war, although it is not recognized as such by us.
he really had to learn on his feet uh, in many ways, uh, and, and um, that's you know discussed in the annals where he's propelled and thrust in to this bloody uh, coup and this battle power struggle, and he has to figure out quickly how can he, as a diplomat, um, sort of smooth things over. A diplomat has two charges. Major charge is to execute the foreign policy of the U.S. The second charge is to make sure that the country that we're in understands that the U.S. has the best interest of not only the U.S., but of that country in mind. As the fighting worsened, Bassett joined with his fellow diplomats from the British and French embassies and went marching up to the palace to try and negotiate an end of the conflict and to ask Salnav to step down. The Haitian president refused. In the end, there was little they could do to hold back the waves of discontentment as rebel troops swarmed through Port-au-Prince. From his residence overlooking the city, Bassett and his family heard cannons booming as Sajay's forces pounded the city. A few errant rounds even landed near the Bassett's property. Civilians rushed for cover, many coming onto Bassett's 15-acre compound. Soon, almost 3,000 terrified women and children refugees filled the grounds of his home. Eliza Bassett and her young children attempted to assist as many as they could, but in the end, they were simply overwhelmed. What jumps out at me is, again, sacrifice. His ability to sacrifice, and, and it's not he sacrificed for himself and on, for him for it for his you know protecting his own good, but his family was there. That's the thing that blows my mind. It's like I can understand somebody doing the things that he did, but your family is there. He's really pioneering um, the concept of political asylum. Bassett is in the immediate proximity of people who can be slaughtered in front of him, and he protects them. He does resolve things successfully. I think he's a remarkable, remarkable example of diplomatic um, ability, uh, white or black. Eventually, the rebels struck the fatal blow, destroying the palace as Salnav fled across the Dominican border, vainly seeking help from his ally, President Buenaventura Baez of Santo Domingo. But he was quickly captured by Dominican rebels allied to Sage and brought back to Haiti for quick justice, executed in the smoldering ruins of his former palace. Bassett then negotiated with Sage for the release of thousands that still sat panic-stricken in his compound. Sage was reluctant, demanding a list of refugees so that he could determine who might be political enemies. Bassett refused, boldly telling Sage, you will pardon me for reminding that the holding of women and children as hostages is repugnant to modern civilization and especially to the government of the United States. Sage finally gave in. With little regard for his personal safety, Bassett escorted the refugees into the heart of the capital to return to their homes. Others captured did not fare as well as Bassett's group. Many were quickly killed, having their throats slit, because the new government did not want to waste time on trials. Bassett was a very good example of leadership. In terms of human rights, he stood up and he accepted refugees who would have otherwise been killed. That was against the policy of the State Department. But he was on the ground and he realized that this was something that he had to do and of course, when it worked out well, everybody in the State Department took credit. He made the decision unilaterally that he was going to bring people in and save those lives. And to me and, and my family, that is one of the most significant contributions that Ebenezer Bassett made in his lifetime. Bassett dealt with numerous confrontations over his eight-year assignment to Haiti and the Dominican Republic. In 1870, President Grant pushed the United States to annex the Dominican Republic, which caused instability on both sides of the island. Well, let's start with the Haitian rule. They were very negative to the idea of the annexation of the Dominican Republic because they saw it as a first step towards the annexation of Haiti also. And Grant was always referring to the annexation of the island, the island, the island. He mentioned it 
nine different times. But the Dominican president, Buenaventura Valles, favored the annexation. He felt he was going to be rich because all his assets would increase in value because, well, because of the annexation. Valles was opposed by Dominicans who were against him and against annexation. They considered him a, a traitor. And they were physically fighting him and using Haitian soil as a place from which to attack. And they had the help of the Haitian president, Saget, for example. Saget threw his support to undermine annexation efforts by backing Dominican rebels, Marco Antonio Cabral and Gregorio Luperon. Secretary Fish instructed Bassett to warn the Haitians against supporting an uprising on the Dominican side while the sensitive negotiations were underway. Bassett repeatedly went to the Haitian government to demand a withdrawal, but Saget refused. Political leadership in Washington became agitated, and the U.S. Navy sent seven warships to press the point. If Bassett were unsuccessful in its negotiations, the State Department instructed him to break diplomatic ties with Saget and leave. Bassett knew it would lead to a war throughout the island and was insistent that he be allowed to let diplomacy work. Furiously, he persuaded the Haitian government that it was in no one's interest to continue down this path. In the end, Bassett succeeded, and Haitian troops withdrew to their side of the island as annexation negotiations began. But as the ceasefire took place on the island, the political battle heated up in Washington. So Charles Sumner's, amongst his arguments, was that Grant had sent vessels to fight on the side of bias against Cabral and Luperon, which was an act of war and had not been approved by the U.S. Senate. Sumner asked and got all the files on the instructions to the U.S. Navy and also files on the correspondence with the U.S. commercial representatives in Santo Domingo who were very hostile to the annexations because they knew that Baez was a dictator, they knew the population was not in favor of it, they knew there was a lot of corruption, and they reported on it. In spite of concerns coming from Bassett's team on the ground, Grant's personal secretary quickly concluded the treaty. It called for American payment of Dominican debts and the eventual statehood for the Dominican Republic. Most importantly from the U.S. side, it allowed for a naval base on the northern coast in Samana Bay. The treaty was rushed to the Senate for a vote, where it immediately ran into trouble with Senator Sumner. Knowing what he did about the corruption and concerns of the independence of another country, he led the charge in the Senate to kill the treaty, where it died after a tie vote. Bassett immediately went to work to repair the relationship on both sides of the island in the next years. He witnessed a relatively peaceful presidential transition in Haiti in 1874 when Saget turned over control to Michel Domingue. But soon again, Bassett would be confronted with another human rights crisis, this time at his very doorstep in 1875. Ambassador Bassett was ambassador of the United States while my great, great grandfather was American consul in Capetian. On the 1st of May, President Michel Domingue went after three of his opponents. Bruce Brice, who was killed, and Pierre Montplaisir Pierre was killed, and Brown Canal, who was about to be killed, but fortunately, he escaped. He was living in Frere, near Pétionville, and walked to the U.S. ambassador residence and took refuge in it, and Bassett protected him. I was so struck um, by one of the accounts I had read in which he had sent a dispatch to Secretary of State Fish saying, I didn't know General Canal. This was not someone I had met before. But when he came to me with a few members of his family and asked for refuge, I gave it to him because his life was at risk. That took bravery, that took on-the-spot decision-making. It wasn't dilly-dallying saying, gee, I gotta check with headquarters. That would have taken weeks. He demonstrated uh, the very qualities that we're looking for today in the Foreign Service. As General Canal and his relatives staggered into the diplomat's home at 2 a.m. and sought protection, Bassett's best instincts took over. Knowing that Domingue's army was hunting the weary, terrified men, he shut the door behind them, providing the delicate veil of protection that diplomatic immunity offered. He later wrote to Secretary of State Fish, It may be that the instinct for humanity got the better of me, 
The men before me were not my personal friends. They had never visited my house before, nor I theirs. I had no merely personal interest in them. After a sleepless night, Bassett went into the city and learned that massive arrests were taking place and martial law was now in effect. That afternoon, a close friend warned Bassett that he should return home at once. He found hundreds of armed men outside his gates and more troops on the way. It was clear that the worst kept secret in Haiti was over and Canal's location had been discovered. The Haitian president demanded to know the name of every refugee hidden in Bassett's residence. In spite of threats, Bassett steadfastly refused. I must confess that the presence of a thousand armed men around my country residence, with discontent stamped on their faces and Henry rifles in their hands, does not quite give the best possible ground to my hope. When Secretary Fish heard the news, his first reaction was irritation, wanting to be rid of the problem as soon as possible. Bassett responded, I am not unaware that the ground taken in my several dispatches may not be in accord with the requirements of public law, but circumstances seem to crowd in upon me without warning, and in such a way as to leave me almost no choice. Men maddened by passion, inflamed as I am credibly informed by rum, and elated by consciousness of armed power, were pursuing their fellow countrymen with red-handed violence. To have closed my door upon the men pursued would have been for me to deny them their last chance of escape from being brutally put to death before my eyes. I look at what Ebenezer Bassett was doing in the 1860s and the 1870s here with a thousand people outside his residence, not just for one night, but for many weeks while he sheltered those vulnerable he was their voice. He was the voice for people who didn't have a voice in those days. And, and that's a hero in my book. Bassett first raised the idea of sending a U.S. warship in a May 8, 1875 letter. He argued that a show of force would exert a wholesome influence and strengthen our own moral force in resolving the matter. Fish flatly refused. As the conflict dragged on for weeks, with both Bassett and Domingue digging in their heels, Washington remained paralyzed. The prevailing sentiment is unmistakably in favor of Canal, and in our favor because we have firmly protected him against violence. Still, political arrests and killings continued. The awful fact stares me in the face that we are all under a reign of terror. By summer's end, President Grant had finally had enough. Fish wrote to Bassett, It has been determined to apply to the Navy Department to order a man of war to Port-au-Prince. Just as the ship was preparing to leave, President Domingue finally gave in. Bassett could escort Canal safely out. Just after midnight on October 5th, 1875, after five months as a refugee inside Bassett's home, Canal boarded an American flagged ship setting sail for Jamaica and safety. At the end of the Grant administration in 1877, Bassett submitted his resignation, as was the custom. In spite of any lingering resentment that may have existed in Washington because of his defiant stances, it was impossible for the State Department not to recognize Bassett's work. Acting Secretary of State F.W. Seward wrote to Bassett, thanking him for his years of service. I cannot allow this opportunity to pass without expressing to you the appreciation of the Department for the very satisfactory manner in which you have discharged your duties of the mission at Port-au-Prince during your term in office. This commendation of your service is the more especially merited because at various times your duties have been of such a delicate nature as to have required the exercise of much tact and discretion. When Bassett returned to the United States, he spent a decade in New York City as Haiti's Consul General. There, he continued to bridge the divide between the countries and work toward a betterment of bilateral relations. However, Bassett continued to hope for another assignment with the State Department. Bassett required the support of political patrons for the position and turned again to his friend Douglas. At 70 years old, he was the preeminent black voice in the nation, but Douglas also longed to add a diplomatic posting to his stellar resume. In 1889, newly elected President Benjamin Harrison decided not to nominate Bassett. Rather, he chose the man who had campaigned on his behalf, Frederick Douglass. Bassett must have been crushed when he saw the headlines, but instead of sulking, he wrote a five-page congratulatory letter to his friend. The offer of the mission to you is a tribute to your high character. 
You will see that I have never wavered in my esteem, my veneration for you. Another thing that um, Ebenezer Bassett did that I found exceptionally um, unusual in a diplomatic corps was when he was passed over for the second appointment to Haiti and the appointment was given to Frederick Douglass, he immediately volunteered to be helpful because he knew Frederick Douglass was older than he. He knew the language and uh, Frederick Douglass did not know the language. And he was familiar with all of the players, not to mention the terrain. And so he offered himself up as a backstop, as a number two, in support to Frederick Douglass, who would be the principal. Mr. Bassett's position will be more important than that of private secretary. He will be Minister Douglass's right-hand man while in Haiti and be responsible to the minister for the conduct of the office, ran one article of their voyage. The most crucial part of their mission was a highly secretive negotiation from Washington. After the failure of the Dominican annexation to gain Samana Bay, as a growing military power in the world, the United States longed for additional expansion. Plans were already underway for construction of a canal in Central America that would eventually connect the Atlantic and the Pacific for both commercial and warships. As part of this growing maritime power, Douglas and Bassett were to launch initial discussions to obtain a port for the U.S. Navy on the northern coast of Haiti at Mont Saint Nicolas. Bassett was skeptical this could be negotiated, knowing the fears of the Haitian people about their hard-won territorial integrity. Time, however, was not on Bassett and Douglas' side. At the beginning of 1891, a Navy admiral arrived with a special note from Secretary of State James Blaine. It seemed that Admiral Bancroft Girardi, rather than Douglas, had been given the authority to negotiate for the Mole San Nicolas. Douglas considered resigning in protest, but as he later wrote, I consoled myself with the thought that I was acting like a good soldier. Bassett and Douglas set up a meeting with the foreign minister and president of Haiti in 1891. But Girardi would not allow Douglas to bring Bassett with him. Instead, he brought his young staff lieutenant, fluent in French, to act as interpreter. It left Douglas at a distinct disadvantage. He would later write of the occasion. I have reason to regret the absence of Mr. Bassett, for it left me at the mercy of men whom I begin to think have intentionally misrepresented me. During the meeting, Girardi took the lead, pressing hard on the fact that the Haitian president had promised the mole during the rebellion after gaining U.S. support. The offensive manner in which Girardi was conducting the negotiations not only disturbed the Haitians, but also Douglas and Bassett. It would never work here. That attitude would never work here. We, you could do anything here. But if you are aggressive hating Haitian, being arrogant, especially if that arrogance in your mind is based on racial things, you are in the wrong situation. That would never work here. Douglas tried to calm the waters, but the damage of trying to force Haiti's hand was already done. In the end, the Haitians refused to lease Mole San Nicolas, and Admiral Girardi returned home empty-handed. Back in New Haven on leave, Bassett read the flurry of newspaper articles coming out. A majority of the media were harshly opposed to Douglas returning, saying he was acting more as a representative of blacks than of the United States. In the face of growing pressure, Bassett told his friend to remain strong. Nonetheless, the elderly Douglas had had enough. By July of 1891, Douglas submitted his resignation. It's, it's definitely, I don't want to say it was a disaster, but I think it was, it was much, much less than a success. And I think he feels it very keenly. And when I read the newspaper accounts, some of them are, are, are straightforward racist accounts because these two men are black. So Douglas Bassett are diplomats, but they are black diplomats. So going to the States, anything goes wrong, of course, they will put it on you. Bassett, who had continued to hope for a future appointment as a diplomat, now saw himself on the outs politically, and he would never again serve the U.S. government in any diplomatic role. He, he disappears. Um, and again, the reasons for this, I, I don't fully understand because 
The mission to Haiti was, I, his original mission to Haiti, I think was remarkable in many ways, and, and also a United States first. But he, he does come home. Um, he, spends, he spends his time, uh, as I understand it, between three cities. He goes between New York and Philadelphia and, Phil, and uh, New Haven. And um, he has a son that's working in Washington, D.C., and sometimes spends time with him. Um, he would go back and spend time with his daughter, Charlotte, who would follow in his footsteps as a, um, as a, a, a great uh, educator. And um, his wife would pass. Um, I think it was a difficult and lonely existence for him. He would never have any grandchildren. He would die on Fulton Street in New York City, in Brooklyn, I think it is. Unlike other peers who broke the color barrier in other professions, Ebenezer Bassett would be forgotten with the passing of time. But the importance of diversity that he made possible is more vital than ever in diplomacy. After Bassett's appointment, other African-American men would follow in his footsteps representing the United States. In spite of efforts to make our diplomatic corps look more like America, the statistics show there is still a way to go. Bassett and this legacy of diversity is important, and much work still remains. So a diverse opinion enriches the whole foreign uh, policy experience because you've got people thinking about it from different angles. I joined the Foreign Service under a program called the Thomas R. Pickering Fellowship. And this is a fellowship that recruits minorities um, who are interested in the Foreign Service. It provides them sort of mentorship, a little more information about the Foreign Service. I'm from North Carolina, so this was not a career that you hear often about. And so it's, it's been really special for me to have this chance to come into the Foreign Service and to be amongst these uh, amazing men and women who give their lives for our country, uh, serving abroad, uh, to ensure that our relationships are strong, our partnerships are strong. I can only imagine what uh, Bassett was dealing with during those times, because um, even now there are hard issues, complicated issues, and to know that I'm not the only one of color in the room working on them is, is a bit comforting. The Wrangell Fellowship is a fellowship program designed to help infuse diversity into the State Department, and I was given the opportunity to participate as a Wrangell Fellow. When I'm serving in countries abroad, I think it's important that we represent to the people that America is a, has a diverse landscape and that Americans have the opportunity to, to serve in many capacities. When I'm out and I'm doing a project on women's empowerment or youth engagement, and I'm in southern Mexico or Pakistan or South Africa and working with a group of young girls, and one comes up to me and says, so you're an American and you're a diplomat too? And I see a little question at first and then a little sparkle in their eye and I'm able to explain to them that I too am a part of the American story. It's more important now than it ever was. That diversity of opinion, uh, that diversity of experience, um, I think really helps contribute to us finding the best approaches uh, to the challenges that we face um, around the world. It also strikes me that um, who we are and what we look like to the outside world is incredibly important. Every single one of these tours, in a curious and, and generally um, conversational way, every single tour I've been asked, but you don't look like an American. <laughs> where, where are you from? Or where, where are your parents from? And I have always, always loved that question. Two of my grandparents were born in the Philippines. One of my grandmothers was born in Lithuania, and my other grandfather was born in Portugal. There is no place else where we would have a Philippine, Portuguese, Lithuanian woman sitting here as an ambassador. It's a great American story, uh, and it's my story. All Each of us bring different backgrounds, different qualities, different perspectives. I think that's the business case for diversity in any organization. And I think those who have come before us have proven that diversity works, diversity matters. This notion of passing a mantle, I think uh, Mr. Bassett did it, Frederick Douglass did it, Colin Powell has done it and continues to do it, and now it's our turn. Though largely forgotten since his death in 1908, Bassett was a diplomat of consequence. It is clear that his legacy has had a lasting influence.
Bassett's courage, leadership, and integrity can now inspire a new generation.